Okay, cool. Um, so this, just a quick order of business. Uh, uh, this is my last uh, full class with this um, with this cohort. Um, Tovio will be taking, I think, are we doing doing next week? Or is this the last week? Yeah. Um, so Tovio will be um, leading uh, Monday. Yeah. Um, and am I am I totally off here? <laughs> um, let me look at the schedule here. Yeah, Tovio will be uh, taking uh, next week. So um, I I do plan on on um, being here for the the last class, not this, but next Monday. Um, but yeah, so just wanted to say that uh, it's been really fun working with y'all. Um, I really like this group dynamic, and presumably some of you will be uh, deferring also to the um, to the next uh, round of premium prep. Um, if you don't know, I just wanted to mention, let me actually stop the screen share for this, sorry. So I just wanted to mention, if you're not familiar, um, we have a, a bit of a different model. So you, you're welcome to defer as many times as you want for, um, you know, obviously you, you pay once and then you can just defer without paying for the next uh, uh, premium prep. So that's just part of the model. You can go through premium prep as many times as you need. Um, if you want to do that, just let us know. You're welcome to stay through the end of the class and then, you know, just also go into the next one. Uh, if you feel like you need more practice, um, you're not ready to pass your TI yet, we recommend doing that. Just kind of helps us keep keep track of you and, and keep uh, an eye on your progress and things like that. Um, do feel free to reach out for mentoring if you need any additional support. Uh, me or Tovio, or um, there's also Lance and Devin and Remy. Uh, they have uh, staff in the their uh, handle on Slack. So uh, you can reach out to any of us for mentoring. We're happy to help as best we can, however we can. Cool. Let's jump into the material for today. All right, so we got a bit to get through. Um, last time we covered this uh, data structures lecture, we got through dictionaries and sets. Uh, we're gonna talk about tuples. I left tuples for last because you already know most of how tuples work. And I mentioned this before, they're very similar to lists. Um, we'll kind of get into that. But I hope that we're going to have some time to do review of dictionaries. And I know that comp uh, a lot of people are interested in comprehensions. Um, and hopefully we'll, we'll have time to get some, to some examples of comprehensions as well. So let's just start with tuples. Um, so tuples, let's see if I can find the uh, section on this. It should be at the bottom. Okay, so. so tuples. Uh, so tuples are an ordered collection Whenever you hear something described as ordered, you can think about that as having an index. Those are different ways of describing what is effectively the same thing. If something has an order, you can count on its elements. If you can count on the elements within that uh, object retaining an order, then you can, uh, you can assign an, an index to each position and that index will mean something. If the type doesn't obey an order consistently, then if you assign an index, you wouldn't be able to count on that index giving you the, a predictable result, right? So when something has an order, it makes sense to index it uh, and, or assign, you know, uh, yeah, index, assign an index uh, to, 
to each element and so python you know will will treat ordered types uh, uh, with indices so if you're comfortable with um subscripts which is you know indexing in lists um, and strings it works exactly the same in tuples so I'll I'll go over what I mean here sorry I'm just cleaning my glasses a little bit make these good and <coughs> cool um, so let's look at an example of this so if I say uh, what should I call this I'll just call this object equals let's let's just look at a list and we'll say uh, 44 55 66 so if I want to I'll do a few more um, if I wanted to index into this list to get this 66 right here I could say print obj sub and well oops we'll subscript into index 0 1 2 right so we'll say sub 2 Okay, uh, so if I print obj object sub 2, that's going to give me that uh, third element or second index. So let's make this into a tuple. All I do is just put parentheses around it, and it's exactly the same. So there's no difference between if, if this were with where indexing is concerned, right? There's no difference between how indexing is going to work with a tuple and how it's going to work with a list. Why don't I do this? We'll say list and we'll call this tup. Okay. So that's a tuple. Uh, so they are ordered collections like lists. Um, the major difference with with between lists and excuse me the major difference between lists and tuples is that tuples are immutable whereas lists are mutable um, mutability tends to be realized in um, in methods so there are some mutable operations that we can do to lists that we don't do through methods. Um, but most of the mutable operations uh, happen via some method. So if I, let's just look at this here. Um, let's see. Uh, what do I want to do? Uh, we'll do dear directory of list. Oops. There we go. So you've seen me do this before. And we're going to look at all the regular name uh, methods here. Let's clean this up a little bit. So um, let's go through each of these and kind of think about what they do, right? So uh, we'll just go through a, we'll just go through a few actually. Um, so append does does append mutate the list or not? These are list methods. You do thumbs up or thumbs down or yes or no, yes would be yes, it mutates the list. Go ahead and put it in Slack. Cool, we 
we've got a lot of yeses. Any dissenters? I'm guessing no. Yeah, so this is uh, mutable. Um, let's do the same thing here. Clear, is clear mutable or immutable? <laughs> Sorry, I kind of changed the terms of uh, answering the, the question there. Uh, you can just put in mutable or immutable. Just say mutable or immutable. Sorry about that. <laughs> uh, clear method that mutates the string. Ah, interesting. Uh, list, yes, list, not string. Cool, mutable, yep. Okay, and then copy. Copy, does this cause a mutation? This is kind of a weird one. Does this cause a mutation or not? Does this change the list? Mutable or immutable? Yep, so this one's immutable. What's interesting about copy is that it's only, the only reason, even though it's immutable oper an immutable operation, um, the only reason it's useful is because lists have mutable other mutable operations. So that way, if we want to <coughs> perform a mutation on a list, we can copy it and then perform the mutation on either the original or the copy, and then have have some probably the copy and then have the original left over. Um, so that's kind of interesting. So uh, you can think through all of these. I just kind of wanted to get you all engaged in thinking about this because anytime you learn a new method for a given type, and you have to remember this with methods specifically, uh, even though technically functions are capable of this, uh, so a function can mutate its inputs, that's allowed, but it's never done in Python. Um, it's never done in any of the functions in, um, in the Python standard library, and it should never be done by any other third party library. It's just, it's considered kind of a faux pas, like it's, it's almost like taboo. Like if you wrote a function that mutated one of its inputs, somebody would you know, and you shared that code or something, somebody would certainly uh, contact you and say, like, hopefully they'd be nice about it, you know, <laughs> but um, they they might say, like, hey, do, do you realize that this function is causing a mutation to one of its inputs? So um, in that case, maybe you forgot to add a copy in or something. Uh, so even though functions technically are able to mutate their inputs, we can say that they never do. So functions, it's safe to say functions don't mutate their inputs. Whereas if something causes a mutation, it should be a method or I'll, let, I'll show you another example too of a mutable operation with a list. Um, it's, um, if you know what item reassignment is, it's item reassignment is a, is a mutable operation uh, for lists, but we'll get to that in a second. But every time you learn a new method, you wanna keep track of does this method, and for for any mutable type, right? Because mutable types have methods that will mutate the type and methods that won't mutate the type. So you want to keep track of which types are immutable and which types are mutable. And for the mutable types, you want to keep track of which methods cause a mutation and which don't. Cool. So I'll just go through the rest of these. So uh, copy, count, count is immutable. Um, extend is mutable, index is immutable. Let's do this. Oh, come on. Insert, pop, all the rest of these are mutable. Sort, reverse. This is kind of a weird one. Sort and reverse. I think those, those operations, people kind of 
it's intuitive to think that, oh, this isn't changing the list, but it actually is. Um, if you want versions of these that don't change the list, there's the sorted function and the reversed function. Uh, it's just the past tense uh, form of sort and reverse uh, is used for the function names. And um, those will give you an immutable, those will be an immutable operation. Okay, so if we look through here, if we took away all of the mutable operations, so let's do this. Oh, and I said I would show, um, so there's, there's one operation that I can think of uh, that's fairly common that is, let's do item. It's called item assignment. Uh, it's not a method, but it is a mutable operation in the list. If I have a list of, um, let's do 33, 44, 35, Okay, um, and then I say list sub one, so I'm gonna target this 44 equals hello, print list. So we'll print the before and after, right? So I just reassigned this element in the middle to a different element, and this is considered uh, a mutable operation. Uh, so item assignment is a mutable operation. So something that's worth remembering. We got a couple, looks like a couple questions here. Are all methods immutable? Hmm. Are you asking, that's an interesting question. Um, like in general or for a given type? Somebody's asking, are all methods immutable? And I don't know if that's in reference to like specifically tuples or all methods in general. Uh, in general, no, because we have different um, we have different data types that are capable of uh, having mutations occur, usually via a method. Um, methods, and then uh, yeah. So, sorry, I'm just reading this question here. Oh, uh, a method version of something that has a function as well. Um, I, my guess would be if there's a method that does something and a function that does a similar task, probably the reason to have that distinction is, at all is that functions are understood to, to um, perform immutable operations and methods are perform, uh, can perform mutable operations. So if I saw that pattern where there's like method, um, um, method x and function x that do something similar, I would assume that the difference is that the method is mutable. But that would be an assumption based on the fact that that's, that's the scenario that I can imagine where that would make sense. Not it's not like a steadfast rule that all, all function versions of something that has a method version, you know, has that immutable versus mutable relationship. Um, so yeah. Okay, so. Cool, yeah, you're welcome. Um, so on to tuples. So we just went over these list methods, talking about tuples, looking at these list methods. So if I took away 
all of the, let's do, let's do this. So if I took away all of the ones, all of the methods that were immutable, excuse me, that were mutable, I'd be left with these three, copy, count, and index. So tuples only have count and index. Why don't they have copy? We don't have a copy method for a tuple. Can anybody give an answer on that? I think it's probably understood, but I want to, I want you all to like try to put it in your own words. And I, and I want everybody to try to get in an answer for this. I hear somebody's mic unmuted. If everybody doesn't mind, just go and check, check and make sure your mic is muted. Oh, the question was, sorry. Okay, so I just laid out all the methods for lists and I deleted all the ones that were mutable. And what I'm saying is that when I do that, I'm, I'm left with three immutable methods that lists have and tuples have two of these, right? So tuples have count and index and the question is why wouldn't a tuple have copy? Why don't tuples have a copy method? Cool, yeah. And I just wanted to get everybody kind of engaged in thinking about this. We're going to move on at this point. But um, <coughs> since tuples are immutable, any transform or operation that we perform on a tuple that gives us like a different tuple doesn't cause a mutation. It just gives us a different version. So um, it might, I think initially it's easy to look at it, a tuple as like, as like a, a list that like isn't as good, kind of. It's kind of like a list that's a little disappointing or something. But we can do basically all the same kinds of operations, and I'll show you this in a second here. Um, let's actually let's actually just go through these. So oops. So um, append with a list. If I say list equals empty list, obviously I can do list dot append something. And then I have something appended to the list, right? Um, and you think, okay, well, I guess tuples can't do that. And they can't do that mutably, but I could do tup equals empty tup, just parentheses. Then what I could do is tup plus gets uh, another tup with a single element in it. Now here's, here's a weird quirk about single element tuples. And this applies to tuples with one element in it, right? If I put parentheses around something in Python, it's going to treat that as an evaluation order, right? Uh, it's the P in PEMDAS. It's parentheses, exponent, da, 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 right? And it's, it's going to assume that I just wanted to evaluate that, whatever's in the parentheses first, whether it, I'm using, whether I'm thinking about it, whatever I'm doing in mathematically, or you know if I'm dealing with strings or whatever, it's just going to still evaluate inner parentheses first. So since parentheses do multiple things in Python, uh, since they're the delimiters for function inputs, and they're the delimiters for evaluation order, which I just is what I just talked about, and they're the delimiters for tuples, they kind of have a lot of jobs, so we need to be able to tell Python that, no, this isn't, I'm not 
trying to express an evaluation order here, I'm I'm trying to say that this is a tuple. This is a data type that holds elements. So when you have an, a tuple with a single element in it, it has to end. Uh, you have to have a comma in it. Um, it might be I don't know. Can you do this with a zero element tuple? No, you can't. Um, you can have. You can have a trailing comma actually on a list or a tuple. That's it looks a little weird, but if it helps as a rule of thumb, uh, an empty tuple is just parentheses. And then as a rule of thumb, it would work if you just always left a trailing comma. It might look a little funny, but it'll it'll always work. Um, you don't need to do it on tuples that have multiple elements, just tuples that have a single element though. So I do need to put this comma here, which looks funny, but it's necessary. Okay, so if I do this, oops, and I print the top, this is this is a lot like an append, kind of, right? Like it, it sort of functions like an append. It fills a similar niche. I have an empty tuple, I have this name assigned to an empty tuple, and then I uh, concatenate something against it, right? Remember this plus gets syntax is syntactic sugar for top equals uh, top plus this other tuple. So I'm concatenating two tuples together. And that's all it is. If you're familiar with concatenating strings or concatenating lists, same thing for tuples. Works exactly the same. Uh, and I can kind of model a similar behavior to append in this case um, by overriding the identifier, right? So the reason that this isn't a, a mutable operation is let's just print the IDs here. Uh, we'll print ID of tup and we'll print tup. There we go. So notice We've got two different IDs. We get an empty tuple and then a tuple with something in it, a single element tuple with an object in it, the string. But the IDs are different. So there is some memory duplication that happens with this. Um, Python will go back. What's happening is since the identifier points at one object and then points at a different object, uh, the object that it pointed at previously is orphaned. It's a it's an unnamed object. It's an object that we can no longer access because we've took away its identifier. So Python will go back and clean that out of memory automatically for us. So it won't just linger in memory forever, probably. Um, so in a lot of cases, this is going to work fine. Uh, that's the short story. This kind of uh, accumulation would work fine. And hopefully this is clear. Um, hopefully it's clear that this is a style of accumulation, essentially. Let me just do this. before and after thing. There we go. Okay. Um, clear. Clear is pretty easy. Let's print top. We've got something in the top. Uh, top equals empty top. Right? So we can mimic clear. We already talked about we don't need copy. Uh, count um, top equals, let's say, uh, a tuple of 22, 55, 22, 77, 33, 22, 77, 44. So 
if I want to print, if I want to get the count, if you know how count works for lists, it's exactly the same for tuples. Uh, print uh, tuff dot count um, 99, that's going to be 0. Uh, 55, that's going to be 1. 22, that's going to be, what, 3? It's going to be 2, I think. So just exactly the same. Well, it looks like we've got some questions here. Was wondering why the comma after a single element tuple uh, didn't know the reason. Oh, cool. That's good. Good that, good that you got that clarified. Yeah. Um, let me go through some questions here. Uh, why the comma after something I missed the comment while answering the question on the slide? Um, I'll go over that again if you want to stay on uh, after class. Um, if you remember that question, I'm, and I'm happy to go over that again after class because it's kind of a weird one. But um, for now, just, yeah, just remember that that is the case. Single element tuple takes a comma after it. Um, cool, it looks like we're good to go on that anyways. Okay. <clears throat> if anybody wants that or a similar, you know, if I cover something and it doesn't land, um, you know, feel free to ask, and um, I'm I'm always happy to go over things again if needy after class as well. Okay, uh, let's do extend. So, extend is really exactly the same as uh, oops, as append, right? We just add another element. Um, that's going to be Pretty much exactly the same thing, right? So you can kind of you can kind of see the pattern here. Um, insert, excuse me, index. I'm reading one ahead. Uh, index tuples do have an index method. So if I wanted to do, we'll do this tuple again. Where is that? Get a straight, uh huh? Uh, top print top dot index uh, 22, right? So 22 uh, shows up in a couple of places here, right? So which index is it going to give me? And the answer is if if uh, you're getting the index of something that occurs multiple times, it's going to give you the index of the first occurrence, right? So 22 happens as the very first element in the list. If we do 77. Right, 77 actually occurs 0, 1, 2 at index 3 and 6, index 3 and 6. So uh, this is going to give me 3. So it'll give you the index of the first occurrence. Insert with lists is fairly straightforward. You just uh, list.insert, and then I think it's the index and then the element. I, I actually forget the order of the inputs, but I have to figure that out every time. Um, oops. We'll do, so let's say, this is a, a bit of a weird one with tuples. Let's say I want to insert something. Um, we'll make an expectation here so we can kind of think about this more clearly. Uh, I want to insert something, let's say, here. And we'll just say, so we'll just say hello. We'll just put a hello right in the middle of it. So this is... Uh, 0, 1, 2, 3. Okay, so what I can do is I can use slicing. So basically I can, I can um, if it's not clear, I can model all these immutable, or excuse me, mutable methods for the most part uh, using slicing, concatenation, and indexing. So if I understand slicing, concatenation, or let me do concatenation, uh, slicing, and indexing, CSI. Um, if that helps you to remember CSI, um, there's that show called CSI. So uh, concatenation, slicing, and indexing, if you're comfortable using those three with lists, they work exactly the same with tuples, and you'll be able to um, 
do whatever you want. So let's look at a tuple insert. So we could say tup equals, and we will slice the tuple 0, 1, 2, 3. Um, let me print tup. So what I'm going to do here is I'm just going to try to get the sections on their own. Um, we'll say tup sub. Uh, we want to start at the beginning, and we want to go up to and including three, so we'll go to four. So that should give me that up to that 77, yep. And then we'll say plus, concatenate with a tuple that has the element that we want to insert, uh, hello. And plus, here, let's just make sure that that's working. Oops, forgot my comma. Uh, see, if I left the comma off, it says type error can only concatenate tuple, not string. There we go. Um, so I've got that. And then I want to slice the rest of the tuple. Um, so I need this 33, 22, 77, 44. So that'll be plus, tup, sub. And I want to start at um, 4, I think. Yeah. Like that. Cool, so that's a tuple insert. And you can see how I kind of grew that, right? I just get the first part, make sure I'm adding in the middle part correctly, and then add on the last part. So you can kind of do it step by step. Um, I'll leave it to you, because I don't want to go too far, but I'll leave it to you. Uh, pop and remove. Um, pop removes an, an element. If you know the index of the element that you want to remove, you can remove the element at that index. Remove removes the first occurrence of an element if you know the element you want to remove. So you can kind of go through it. You have to be a little creative um, to do that with a tuple. But uh, basically, just think about it like you've got concatenation, slicing, and indexing. So pop and remove are going to be similar to insert, except instead of including something here, you're going to omit it. Um, okay, I feel like I actually should give examples of this. Uh, okay, so uh, let's say I wanted to pop uh, index, um, and let's create an expectation for this as well. <laughs> I said I wouldn't do it. Here I go. Um, so let's say I want to pop this... Um, this 33 out of the middle. Um, so if I know the index, uh, I can say that's at index uh, 0, 1, 2, 3, 4. So index will be 4. Um, let me just try this. I'm not sure that this is going to work, but. That's a great thing, you know, if it doesn't work, I can just adjust my code. Um, that's a copy, that just copies the thing. So if I do uh, three, I think. Nope, that didn't go. So I wanna do that. And then uh, if I do five, yeah, that does it. Okay, so this will be, IDX, IDX plus one. There we go. So you see, I gotta, I gotta kind of figure that one out every time. But this is the thing, right? Like, it's not. You don't necessarily need to m memorize this form. In fact, don't bother memor. I don't obviously don't have the form memorized myself exactly. Um, you just need to know how to print things off and make small adjustments and it's a scientific method make one change make an observation make another change make an observation so you get the the general form and you're like okay i know if i just concatenate you know two versions of the list 
or, or excuse me, of the tuple against it, itself and just omit one from one of the slices, then I can, um, I can uh, do something that approximates a pop. Um, and then we could do something, we could use the index method to do something that approximates and remove. So we could do, um, let's do the same thing. We'll have the same expectation for this one. Uh, we'll remove that 33. So let's call this Ellie and the element we want to remove is 33. So I could do, um, uh, now I need an index again and index will be equal to uh, top dot index of Ellie, which is 33. And then same thing here. I think this will do the same thing. Yep. Same form will work. So we need to reconstruct that index, but we can do that using the index method uh, given an element. And then reverse and sort, um, just use the reversed and sorted functions. So again, uh, I'm giving examples of these. There's probably multiple ways to use uh, concatenation, slicing, and indexing. I don't want you to memorize these patterns. Like, okay, well, and when I have to do a remove, I've got to do the index method, and, right? Just know that you have these tools at your disposal and um, think about working through your code incrementally like this, like I'm doing, right? It's, I, I want to normalize uh, the idea that like, being good at programming isn't about, you know, memorizing all these forms necessarily. There are, there are algorithms that, um, you know, like you'll get into like, uh, someday you'll get into like uh, formal comp sci algorithms or something, uh, and that will require some memorization. But um, the little details of how to use things like this. You don't need to memorize them all. Just know what tools you have at your disposal and get comfortable with printing things out and, and like calibrating your code. If you can make a close guess, like I said, if you can think about like, oh, I could do something that's like a pop if I just uh, added two slices together and, uh, and omit one and then figure out how to omit one by just printing it off and, and uh, going from there. So making a close guess and then calibrating, you know, make a, a approximation and then calibrate into a specific uh, result. Okay. Grab some of these. Okay, cool. Um, so we covered concatenation, slicing, indexing um, with tuples. We also covered um, the count and index method, and that's basically it. That's that's what tuples are made out of. Uh, are there any uh, other questions? There's one here. Uh, what does EXP stand for? Sorry, uh, EXP is short for, for to me it's my own shorthand for uh, expectation so this is when i was doing this i was saying uh, i'll make an expectation variable just to have something that i can think about so it's clear what i'm trying to do right so when i whenever i go you'll see me do this whenever i write a function i'll start with i'll generally start with the tests and a test is made out of um, a, a test has the structure of for this function with these inputs, I expect this result, right? And if you can, if you can construct a statement that looks like that, you can write a test uh, for any function. Cool. And then. Uh, any questions on tuples? Is there anything that is not clear?
I know there was a question, actually, I'll, I'll do this one more time. Uh, there was a question about single element tuples. Let's just cover this one more time because it's a bit of a weird one. And it's like, um, it's sort of important, but it's also, it's important, but it's also pedantic. It feels, like Python generally does a really good job of not feeling like pedantic, uh, like very particular about small things. But in this case it is, which is annoying, but it's just the way it is. Um, so a single element tuple ends in a comma. The reason is that parentheses do a lot of things. Let's just print this off. Parentheses do a lot of things in Python. You can see that, you know, just with this print, uh, parentheses are delimiting the beginning and the end of the input field for the function, right? So they also control evaluation order. And the example of that is PEMDAS, right? Parentheses exponent, the order of operation in, in math, in mathematical operations. So where you evaluate the innermost set of parentheses first and then evaluate out to the outermost set of parentheses, so on and so forth. So um, that controlling of the order of operations and you know, delimiting you know, which expressions are complete on their own um, holds true in mathematical operations as well as other operations in Python. So it's always this sort of like evaluate the print, what's in the parentheses first, right? So notice the way that Python evaluates these two, the only difference between these two lines is a comma, that one is a single element tuple and the other is a string. So it doesn't, it doesn't see these parentheses and say, oh, well, that must be a tuple. It sees those parentheses and says, well, I'll evaluate what's in those parentheses because um, it doesn't look like a tuple. It just says, I'll evaluate whatever is ever is in, in these parentheses. So that evaluates and then this scope gives back a string, right? So if I did, um, uh, let's, let's do this. We're gonna do this um, thing one equals the tuple thing two equals the string. And if I get the type of the things, uh, I'm typing too fast. Right, so if I get the type of the things, it says the type of one is a tuple and the type of the other is a string. So it just, <coughs> the comma is necessary to tell Python that it's like saying, no, 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 this isn't a thing to be evaluated in an order. It's a tuple. It's a way of explicitly stating, yes, it's got a comma in it. There's only one element in it, but it's still a tuple. So um, looks like we're good on questions about tuples. OK. Um, I want to get into review of dictionaries. Let's do a quick, let's do a quick uh, kind of survey. Um, one to three. How do you feel about dictionaries? One is like I'm really lost. Two is like I'm pretty good, but I have a number of questions. And three is like I feel comfortable working with dictionaries. So. One to three, how are you with dictionaries? OK, 
Okay, I'm getting twos and some threes, high twos and threes. I'm liking that people are putting in floats. Um, I appreciate that. <laughs> you can put in a float if you want. Uh, okay, I'm getting twos and threes. Is there anybody that's a one on this? If you don't want to admit it in public, you can DM me. That's acceptable as well. I don't want to put anybody on the spot. Okay, I'm I'm getting the sense that nobody's a one. Um, let's do. Sorry. Uh, let's do. Same thing for sets. Uh, one to three. How are you on sets? Okay, cool. So I'm getting the, we've got twos and high twos. Um, good, that's fine. <coughs> so I think some, I think some review will be in order. Um, I just wanted to make sure y'all are at like kind of in the two range with sets and make sure that there's not like a bunch of ones or something, uh, people are struggling with sets. Seems like people are kind of like, y'all are kind of where I want you with sets. Um, sets are something, they're important to understand. They're, you know, you'll get a handle over, over time, but they're also something that you, you kind of use, the way I think about it is, you can kind of use whatever data type you want to like store and process your information. And then when you need to do set operations, you can cast those as sets and then you're done. Um, and you don't, you don't as often tend to deal with sets directly in the same way that you do with lists and even tuples and, and dictionaries and stuff. So I kind of think about them as a sort of a secondary type or a little bit on the periphery for me. So I'm kind of okay with y'all being, being twos in that regard. Uh, dictionaries are something that you're going to use fairly frequently, uh, and I, th I think it's safe to say, I mean, this is subjective, but I think it's safe to say that dictionaries kind of have, they're the most complicated type of the types that we've learned. So we'll focus a bit on uh, dictionary review, um, and I think I'm going to, I'll, I'll go into um, comprehensions after we do dictionary review and then um, we'll forego set review for the moment. Um, okay, let's take, this is a good place to take a break. Um, let's reconvene at one minute after the turn of the hour.
All right. Cool. Uh, do feel free, uh, please uh, turn your cameras back on. Um, we we do notice that it helps um, helps people stay engaged uh, when your cameras are on. So if if you feel comfortable, do please turn your cameras back on. Okay. Uh, I got somebody put in a question. Uh, if if somebody was a one, what would I cover? I want to make sure everybody has like a sort of a foundational understanding of these of at least sets. Um, and I just it helps me get an idea of where people are at. Um, if somebody was a one, I wouldn't cover anything that we hadn't already covered. I would just kind of try to reinforce some things. Uh, and that's just the same things that we already covered. Um, and since we've only got about an hour left, it's a matter of like, do I cover sets or comprehensions? It's sort of either or. So um, it's like, do I go over material that we went over again, or do I cover new material? Um, and so it's just, how am I going to delegate that time? Uh, let's see here. So I did actually, um, over the break, uh, I remembered something that I wanted to touch on with sets. We're going to do a very, very quick set review, actually. Uh, so like I said before, the way I tend to think about sets is I use lists and tuples and dictionaries for whatever I need. And then when I need to do a set operation, I cast accordingly, do the operation, and then I'm kind of done with the set. Occasionally, I'll make a set. Uh, every now and again, I've found it useful to make like a set um, accumulator where I'm accumulating directly on a set. Um, if you want to do something like that, just think about it like a list, uh, but instead of dot append, you have dot add, and you won't add duplicates if that, because sets can't contain duplicates. So there's been some times where I've done that, but it's also kind of like a judgment call. In all of those cases, I could have done it with a list, and if I didn't want duplication, I could have put in a, a condition that said, you know, if the element's already in the list, then or if the element is not in the list, then add it, which would prevent duplication in the list. So it's just kind of a judgment call. It's not like a set accumulator actually does anything that a list accumulator, that you can't do with a list accumulator fairly easily. So um, I would say that that's, this is a good starting paradigm. Like ultimately you wanna grow into being, being fully comfortable with all the data types, sure. But to like get you started, just, just use the types that you're familiar with, um, lists and dictionaries, and when you want to do a set operation, cast accordingly. So the set operations that we talked about were um, union, intersection, and difference. And um, there are more set operations. These are kind of the big ones that we, the, we want you to, to kind of have an understanding of. Something that I noticed, um, a student brought this to my attention. On Monday, last Monday, I went through uh, data types. We talked about sets, I think, on Monday. And then Tovio, I think, on Tuesday or Wednesday, Tovio uh, covered set theory. And, and in Tovio's lecture, uh, they talked about union and intersection and uh, complement. So complement, I don't think it's right to say that complement is a direct one-to-one -one synonym for difference. But when you're in Python, when you're thinking about a, a set complement, you're going to be using the difference method. So these ideas are related. Um, I'm not, I won't go into an example for this, but I did want to establish that because somebody brought it to my attention in a mentoring session. And I thought, oh, that, that'd be a good thing to, to make sure that, that there was parity on that, right? So uh, in my lecture and Tovio's lecture, we both covered union and intersection. And 
uh, Tobio framed things in terms of complement. Python in my lecture frames things in terms of uh, difference, but these these are essentially kind of the same thing. Um, when you want to know the complement of something, you're going to be using the dot difference method. And I'll leave that to you to, uh, to figure out all the details of that if you want. Um, but for anybody who is confused on that, why Tobia didn't go over difference and, or why I didn't go over complement, that's that's because um, those two are kind of the same thing. Um, and that's one of those things like when Tobio and I are like working on the curriculum, like we understand that. So it's kind of like, oh, well, that'll be clear. And then it, it's not clear. And it's like, oh, right. That kind of makes sense that it's not totally clear. So I wanted to clarify that. <laughs> um, cool. Let's do some dictionary review and some comprehensions. So are there any, I want to give people an opportunity. I'm going to go over kind of like, just what we talked about with dictionaries before. Uh, I don't expect that everybody who's a two, who said they were a two at this, is going to be magically a three after this lecture. But hopefully, we can kind of smooth some, iron some uh, things out and improve some understandings of dictionaries and kind of improve your confidence in, in figuring out the rest uh, that there is with dictionaries. Um, so if you have specific questions like how do I iterate through a dictionary or like what do I, you know, what what about this specific scenario or you know anything, uh, even if it's a problem from <laughs> Learn um, or something, if you have any specific questions about dictionaries that you know that you don't understand this one thing or something like that, or you're not confident under, in your understanding, uh, you can put that. Uh, go ahead and put that in Slack. For now, I'm just going to do like kind of a quick overview of dictionaries. Okay, we have one question here. Uh, does the the prim prep have an example of either difference or complement? Uh, you mean in the learn materials? I believe so. Uh, if you go to the, there's, um, if you go into the, I think it's in intermediate Python, there's a section on sets in Python, which should give difference of, excuse me, examples of difference, um, the difference method. Uh, and then in uh, the stats materials, there's uh, some um, material on set theory, which covers complement. Uh, there's no place that I'm aware of where we explic explicitly like uh, relate those two ideas, which I think if if there isn't uh, a place where we we do that, I think we should probably add that somewhere. Okay, um, yeah, so get in your dictionary questions. I'm just going to go over the basics here. Uh, dictionaries contain key value pairs in an immutable, excuse me, let me try that again. <laughs> All right, take two. Dictionaries contain key value pairs in a mutable, <laughs> unordered collection. So unordered means we don't have indices. Mutable means it's like a list. We can change it and update the same object without changing to a different object. Um, key value pairs. Um, so in lists and tuples and strings, we have indices that essentially provide a location, a way of locating each value in that in that collection. Um, with dictionaries. we have keys to fulfill that purpose. And a key is something that we have to supply uh, one way or the other. We either, we the programmers, right? We the people writing the code have to um, 
either explicitly state what we want the keys to be or write code to generate the keys in some way. So a key is, uh, a key can be any immutable type. Uh, keys have to be unique in the dictionary, right? If you, if, if that sounds familiar, um, those are the same rules that sets have, right? So sets can only contain unique and immutable types. Um, and for the same reason, actually, because dictionary keys are hashed uh, and set elements are also hashed and you can't hash an immutable type. And if you try to hash two of the same thing, it hashes for the same value. So you'll only end up with one of it anyway. So um, I won't get into the details of hashing and hashing algorithms. It's super interesting, uh, but we unfortunately we don't have time to get into that. Uh, if you want to research it on your own, it's it's not it's not like important to your understanding of, how, of being able to code, uh, but it's an interesting topic. If you want like an interesting like read or something, you read about hashing on Wikipedia or something. Okay, um, so dictionary keys are can be any immutable element, like a string or an int or a tuple um, or a float or even a bool or none. So you can do whatever you want to do. So let's see here. <clears throat> let's just give an example of a dictionary. D equals curly bracket. So here's an empty dictionary. Um, if we want to add a key value pair, I can say D and D sub K equals value. And just to prove ID D D. Right, so you can see, ooh, 256. That's neat. Um, you can see that the ID stays the same, value changes. So that's a mutable operation. So this is kind of what I think about as analogous to an append with a list, is this D sub key equals value. You'll see somebody, say, you'll see some people say uh, to use dot update. I don't really like to use dot update. I like to do the other thing. I like to do it this way. The reason I want to show you dot update is because you will see it. Um, there's some things about it that uh, I find to be kind of. There's some certain there's certain cases where this is more versatile. The uh, item reassignment is more versatile. And it's simpler. And I think it reads better. It reads more clearly. So uh, this will update. Um, yeah, anyways, uh, it, I, I recommend doing things this way. But just know that in certain cases, update will do a similar thing. Um, so we can do that as well. Let's do this. Key 1, value 1, key 2, value 2. Okay. I'm not seeing anybody with specific dictionary questions. So um, I'm not sure exactly what to cover. Um, I'm not going to cover absolutely everything. Um, so if there is something that you want me to cover, put it in. Otherwise, I'm probably going to, we'll probably wrap up dictionary. Uh, accumulation or dictionary reviews soon. I'm just saying, like, don't count on me just covering it. Don't assume that I'm going to cover something if you want. Uh, if you want me to cover something, because I may not. Uh, 
I like, a, so somebody's asking that I, if I like the assignment approach because it's more versatile. Yeah, I would say it's more versatile. I think it's also, it's just, it's, it's a simple mechanic. It's like uh, identifier equals value. It's a simple mechanic. I tend to prefer those kind of simple, simpler operations uh, because they tend to be more versatile. And they tend to be, I don't know, I find I find this to be very clear. Like this is, there's, it's, it is unambiguous what's happening here. I'm, I'm either making or referring to a key that didn't exist. It's just like a variable, right? This behaves exactly it, the same as a variable. Um, you know, it's either updating an existing key in the dictionary or it's creating a new one, just like it would be if it was a variable, so. I understand how variables work, and this just falls right in line with that, and I like that. It's consistent, it's straightforward. So, uh, anyways, <coughs> keys, values, and items. So when we're dealing with a dictionary, let me do my silly car dictionary. Um, make, Uh, model. And year. Um, well, let's see. I don't know. This is fine. Oops. Model year. Print car. So when you're dealing with a dictionary, um, often a question that you'll want to ask, ask yourself is, do I want to deal with, with whatever I'm doing Am I concerned with the keys? Are the keys the important information? Are the values the important information? Do I need both or do I just need one or the other, right? Um, if you're iterating, the simple answer is just iterate through both. Always iterate through both. For So if I say for um, K in car, we'll do for key in car. If I iterate through the car, directly like this, I get the key, just the key, not the value, just the key, make model year. The reason for that is, well, I don't know, you know I don't know, to be honest, if I were writing that, it kind of makes sense to do value as well or to return a tuple with the key and a value in it, but that's not what they did. Uh, but the reason to give the key and not the value, it's not quite as arbitrary of a choice as you might think. Uh, if I say V equals car sub K. So I can still access the value like this, but I have to like, I have to do car sub K directly, which is a little, a little clunky. So there's a more elegant way to do this. If you're going to iterate through a dictionary, just do dot items, dictionary dot items. And that'll give you both key and value. Like that. Um, there's a question, what do I like update for? I never use it, I just do the other thing. I, in my own code, I don't use dot .update. I don't find it useful. Um, there's this sort of idea in programming that at, I, I get the idea, <laughs> at times it's kind of silly and I think this is one of the silly times. There's this idea that like a method makes a, some operation easier. And in this case, I mean, shoot, in, in this case, like the, the non-method line is shorter and I think clearer. Um, this to me just doesn't need to be a method, but uh, a lot of people have this idea that like making a method for something makes it more explicit, makes it more semantic, makes it clearer. Um, 
I don't hate the dot update exists. I'm not like opposed to its existence. It's just I don't I don't choose to use it. Um, but it's it's there to sort of like satisfy a paradigm that you see a, a lot in a lot of programming language languages, which is like kind of like having a method for something makes it better. And in some cases that's true. You know, uh, if if performing some operation that takes me 30 lines of code to perform can be done in a single method call, then yeah, I'll take the method call rather than having to write 30 lines of code every time I want to do that thing. But, um, you know, in this case, I can do the same thing in one line and I prefer the other way. And, and it is a personal preference, you know, and I want to make sure that that's clear. Uh, some people like to use dot update. I think that's kind of more typical, but um, I don't think it's unpythonic to do it this way. Somebody might disagree with me though. Okay, um, cool. Can you use dictionaries for math operations or is that not really what they're for? Hmm, well, when I think, when you say math operations, to me that means math operators, like add, subtract, um, multiply, divide, power, root. And those operations are not possible with a dictionary. I, I don't think you can concatenate dictionaries. You know what? Let's try this out. I'm pretty sure you cannot concatenate dictionaries. Let's do this. Uh, but concatenation is not Concatenation might look like a mathematical operation because it you, you might think, oh, well, it's a math operation because it uses the plus. Uh, it is explicitly thought of as not a mathematical operation. That's why we call it concatenation. Yeah, so plus operand is not supported between dictionaries. So, um, so we can't use it for mathematical, like the, the way that I would interpret that is we can't, is, I would say a no, because we can't use it in mathematical op operations with mathematical operators, because it's not a number and it doesn't obey the same rules as like an enter or float. Um, but what I think you mean is, is there an application for using dictionaries in doing math? And yeah, there definitely is. Um, <coughs> let's say you're counting um, event occurrences or something, you know, like you have uh, a binomial distribution and you want to see how many times, um, how many times you get an outcome with a certain number of successes. Um, you could, you could create a dictionary for each possible, uh, uh, outcome, right? You know, so, or each possible number of successes, right? I'll give you an example. If I flip a coin 10 times um, and I wanted to, I wanted to generate a dictionary that would tell me um, how many possible combinations of 10 coin flips uh, there are for each possible number of heads, right? So we'll just say heads is a success case. So I could say, you know, it's possible that I get zero heads. It's possible that I get one head. It's possible that I get two heads or three or four, five, six, seven, eight, nine to 10. Uh, it's not possible that if I flip a coin 10 times that I get a result of 11 heads, right? Because I didn't flip it that many times. So I can make a dictionary where the keys are zero through 10. Um, and that would be, that would tell me, you know, the the possible outcomes, and then the values would be how many combinations lead to that outcome, right? So how many ways, for example, you could probably do this in your head. I suspect that all, probably all of you will be able to answer this. Uh, and we'll, if I flip a coin ten times, how many possible ways are are there for me to flip? one head and nine tails. How many how many possible combinations of 10 flips lead to a result with exactly one head? Let me turn my light on. Go ahead and put your answer in Slack.
just one. So I guess it depends on how you're thinking about it. I asked that question and I was like, oh, it might seem like just one, but um, perhaps it's a problem with the way I formulated the question. <coughs> Let's look at this. So if I have a list that records uh, flips Let's do this. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Okay, cool. So I, here's one. Here's another. Here's uh, another. Oops. Let me do it this way. Do you see where I'm going with this? Ah, oh. how do I do this? Sorry. So you can see it's a little hard to see. Maybe I should make these. I'll make all the T's like lowercase T's so the H's stand out a little more, right? So there's one, two, three, because this event could occur. Like each of these are, are valid permutations of the list, right? So there's there are 10 places where this event could occur. Let's just do this. Why don't I do this? Right. So therefore, if I were writing a dictionary uh, to model this, I'm, I might say uh, D. Well, I'd probably create an entry dictionary and do my calculation and my process and count everything. And probably make this an accumulator, but ultimately the D we would uh, we would expect we would have our expectation that the D the dictionary would have something like, um, let's just do 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. OK. And then each of these is going to get, oops, each of these is going to get a colon and then some number after it. Why don't I do this? And I'm not going to go through and calculate all of these in my head because it's take a while. OK. Um, so there's one combination that leads to no heads. There's one combination that leads to 10 heads. Um, there are 10 combinations that lead to 9 heads. And there are 10 combinations that lead to um, um, 1 head, right? Excuse me, nine combinations. Wait. Two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Yeah, okay, so there's ten. Right. And then we could do the rest of these as well, right? So when you ask if if uh, dictionaries are used in mathematical operations, a lot of times we will use them to um, to sort of keep track of maybe counts of different kinds of events. Um, so they're really good for like categorizing data. They're really useful for that particular thing. You know, maybe the categories are are different than this too. Um, but whatever your categories are, if you can discern, you know, make a, a discernment about uh, how what what category something falls into, you can make a, a 
key, you can have the keys model the categories and then all the uh, events that fall into each category as the values. Hopefully that helps answer, answer that question. Um, can you join two huge dictionaries together, like a dictionary containing farm animals and a dictionary containing zoo animals? Um, I think so. Oh shoot, maybe you would use update for that. Actually, I might use update for that. <laughs> yeah, come to think of it. I'm not sure if the dictionary passed can be, hmm. yeah, I don't know. Uh, somebody's asking, isn't 0 to 10 11 items? Yeah, so there are 11 possible outcomes here, um, but there are 10 outcomes that have only one head. It's kind of a weird one, but OK. Moving on. Um, well, we covered items there. Um, this is going to, I'll cover check for membership and items together. If I have, let's do this. I'll just use this dictionary since it's got some stuff in it. Oops. Uh, we'll just call it D. So if I have this dictionary, I could say uh, print um, hello and D dot keys. If I want to see if something is in the keys, uh, there are two ways to do this. Probably the more conventional way is to just check the dictionary directly. If you check the dictionary directly, it will not check keys and values or keys or values. It will check just keys. This is convention. Uh, I don't like it. And what I recommend you, you do is just do dot keys. The reason I don't like this is it's not I notice beginner programmers, I, as much as I say, you know, this checks only the keys. When I see people try to do this, I almost always see that their assumption is that it's doing keys or values or something like that. And it doesn't. It just doesn't. So, um, I would just say the simple rule is just avoid this for now. When you see this, the reason I'm covering it at all is when you see this, um, just know that that is checking for membership in the keys only. So what I recommend in your own code while you're thinking through problems, if you want to see if something is a key in a dictionary, check if it's in d.keys. This is explicit. This is clear that you're checking in keys. So I want to see uh, if seven is in the keys. So hello is not in the keys. Oh, printin. Printin is not a function. You know what? Oops. Print is a function. There we go. So hello is not in the keys, but seven is in the keys. And if I want to see uh, values, I can check in d.values. Uh, so hello is, let's just do this. Hello is uh, false. It's not in the keys of the dictionary. Um, seven is also false. Or excuse me, that's going to be true. Uh, 
uh, both of these are going to be false. And this one's going to be true. Cool. All right. We got a question about the X seeming confusing. Um, is 10 appearing in the values just arbitrary? Uh, so in this case, we have 10 in the value in two values in two places. So this is modeling like a series of coin flips. What this is saying is that there is there are 10 combinations. These 10 lists. Uh, there are 10 combinations. Excuse me, permutations. There are ten. There are ten possible lists of flips that can be recorded that have exactly one heads in them. There are ten. There's not eleven. There's ten. Uh, and the same goes for nine. There's nine possible lists that contain. Excuse me. There's ten possible lists that contain exactly nine heads. bit of a weird one. Um, I can go over more examples of, of problems like that after class. I can we can do like a little binomial exploration thing. So exp is referring to the number of heads. The keys are referring to the um, number of heads in a series of 10 coin flips uh, possible, number of heads possible after flipping a coin 10 times. And the values are referring to the number of possible outcomes that that result in exactly that number of heads. OK. Um, cool. I want to get into comprehensions. We have 20 minutes left, which is less time than I thought we would have to cover comprehensions. Real quick though, um, I I do want to uh, I do want to put this this question and this kind of question aside for the moment. Um, if there's interest, I mean it's kind of an interesting question. If if people want me want me to give an example, I will do so after class. Um, there's a little bit of setup to it, so I'm you know rather than getting lost in the weeds, in kind of generating this. Uh, this dictionary for real, um, I'm just kind of saying, okay, we do something and we get a dictionary that kind of looks something like this, uh, just as a as an example. Um, it is an interesting thing, but if people want to stay on after class, I'll give an example of this. Um, but before I move on to comprehensions, is there anything that sort of, you know, like accessing a key or a value or accessing a value from a from a key or you know sort of anything regarding like dictionary basics just using a dictionary in your code that somebody has a question about got some thumbs up okay good i'm going to assume everybody's good on dictionaries at least for now. Let's talk about comprehensions. So this is a, this is a there okay. There are two types of comprehensions. There are list comprehensions and dictionary comprehensions. I'm probably just going to mostly cover list comprehensions and kind of mention dictionary comprehensions because most of the rules are the same. Um, a comprehension. There's a reason why this is the last thing that I'm kind of covering uh, in, you know, in the Python material. I do want to touch on it because they're cool. They're, they're, there's something like really neat about using comprehensions, 
they don't actually, I want to be clear about this though. A comprehension doesn't do anything that you can't already do with the material that we've covered. Um, let me go through the overview for this. So we have types, abstraction, types, abstraction, um, control flow, iteration. Again, this is not every topic that there is in programming or in Python, um, but this is this is the core for all those other topics. You know, understanding this core of things um, is going to help you learn all the rest of of everything else in Python. Um, so, types we've covered int, float, bool, none, tuple, string, oops, list. Dict, set. Okay, uh, so these are the types we've covered. Abstractions, uh, variables, functions. Control flow, that's your if, elif, else. Uh, conditions. Booleans, you kind of want to understand Booleans for these, right? And then iteration is, uh, there, there are lots of ways to do iteration. We've got for loops, we've got while loops, and we've got comprehensions. Maybe I should do it like this. So, um, there are times we ha we kind of have this way of approaching it, at least at least here, where our our philosophy, the way I like to approach teaching this, and I mean just coding in general, is to use for loops wherever you can get away with it. There are certain problems that for loops aren't well suited for solving that while loops can solve. Kind of makes more sense to use a while loop. Um, those problems can can be defined by if whether or not we know before we start looping how many iterations we need to complete um, to, con to uh, finish the solving the problem, right? So if I have a list that I need to iterate through, well, that I may not know at the time of writing the code what the size of some list that that for loop may process is, but I know it's a list or you know a dictionary or a, a tuple. At the time that I start the loop, that object has a size and uh, I can iterate through it, right? So there's a, there's a definitive limit on on that type, so I can use a for loop for that. And for loops are particularly good at iterating through lists and tuples and dictionaries. And they're very well suited for that, or a range. Um, sometimes I just need to do something in times, or I need to iterate through a range. And in those cases, um, I also can discern a number of times that I need to, to perform some process. So I can use a for loop in those cases. Um, certain cases, like um, writing an algorithm to find, you know, given a number, uh, discern, uh, uh, find the next prime number. So some of you are probably have written the next prime function. Um, certain algorithms like that, we can't say for certain um, how many numbers we will need to check before we find another prime number. So for that reason, it kind of makes sense to use a while loop. And the while loop works by checking a condition. It's kind of like an if. It, you know, mechanically speaking, even though it's categorically, it's an iterator, not a control flow item, 
but categorically, uh, so categorically, it's in iter iteration in terms of the the niche that it fills, the um, the purpose that it fills. But mechanically, it's very similar to an if, right? Because if condition consequence. So if the condition is true, it does the thing. Um, and then same thing with while. While condition consequent. The the only difference is once it completes the consequent, it goes back up and says, hey, is this condition still true? And if it is, it does it again. And it does it again. And it does it again until that consequent is, or that condition is made false. So the there's almost always in writing a, a while loop, some part of your condition changes in, or changes or may change uh, in your, um, in the body of the loop, in the consequent of the loop. So that way, eventually, that condition will be false and the loop will stop, hopefully, right? If you wrote it right. So that's for and while. Um, <clears throat> there are problems that while loops uh, aren't well suited for solving and we need an even more powerful iterator called recursion. This is not something we cover in premium prep. It is a very interesting topic and maybe maybe a topic that uh, I would cover in um, um, a study hall or something. Uh, I would I should write up a, a maybe a short lecture on recursion and that'd be fun to cover in a study hall. But um, it's rare that you encounter problems that, or at least it's you will probably in your in your career as a data scientist I encounter problems that require recursive solutions. But um, that's a good topic to learn in the DSI or potentially even after the DSI. It's, it's kind of an advanced topic. Um, so that's how the kind of iterators all fit together. So with comprehensions, comprehensions are very elegant ways of solving some problems that for loops can solve. So just as for loops are sort of a subset of while loops in terms of for loops can solve a subset of problems that while loops can solve, comprehensions can solve a subset of problems that for loops can solve. And the rule here is a comprehension can solve uh, any problem a for loop can solve unless some information needs to be passed between loops, right? So what we can't do in a comprehension is find something in one iteration of the loop that tells us to do something in a future iteration of the loop, right? In in that case, uh, we would need a for loop, so we could we could take information between iterations. Um, comprehensions can't do that, but what what you lose in that capacity, you gain in the ability to parallel parallelize uh, operations. If you know, if one iteration doesn't inform something happening in another iteration, what that means is you can count on all of the iterations being able to be performed uh, in parallel. So comprehensions can, there are other factors involved in this, but they can automatically parallelize um, the iteration sort of behind the scenes for you. That's one thing that they can do. So there's this and there are several other factors that can lead to comprehensions being very, very fast. Um, I don't want people to get caught up in um, optimization too much. Uh, optimization is a is like a fun, I, I like kind of optimization problems, like how you take an algorithm and improve it um to a, a more optimal form or its most optimal form i like those kind of problems and they can be important uh, but i don't want you all to lose the side of like lose sight of like how do i <laughs> how do i just get something working right how do i just make valid code that solves the problem um often that's 
fine and you know in a beginner sense that's kind of where how we want you how do we want you to think about things um, but so, but comprehensions can improve processes i tend to like comprehensions because they're very elegant and they're very kind of succinct so uh, let's actually look at some examples here so let's say let's say i just have a basic list accumulator um, I'm going to have a source list. Source list is going to be equal to, let's say, um, okay. And we're going to have a list. This will be our accumulator. I'll call this ACC. And uh, I can say for num and src. Um, ACC dot append num squared. Let me actually those okay um, I mean I kind of refer to this material in a second here but so this is just going through source iterating through source and accumulating into ACC uh, the square of each number let's print out ACC so this is a perfect candidate to be converted into a comprehension so what I like to do, if you write a for loop like this, if I want to convert this into a comprehension, I'll just crack that open. And then I'll take the append, the th whatever I'm appending. Now remember, it's a list comprehension. So it has, since it's a list, it has kind of knowledge about what a list does. So it has this append functionality kind of built in. And it's meant to be kind of an, uh, an automatic one line accumulator. So this is saying I'm appending num squared for every num in source. Does this make sense? Or does this not make sense to anybody? Hopefully that's clear. You get thumbs up or thumbs down? How are people feeling about this? Does that make sense or not? Uh, what's an example of parallelizing an operation? Um, so this is a good example. We could think about this this process happening in parallel. Um, if my if my if I have a multi-threaded uh, CPU, then then this operation can happen on as many threads as I have available. Potentially, it, there's not a guarantee that it will. There are other factors kind of behind the scenes. Maybe those threads are being used by something else. Yeah, I don't know, um, but there's the potential that this could be uh, uh, automatically threaded. So all this is saying is we need to end up with a list uh, where every number from source is squared. So it can do that. It can do that squaring operation. Let's say I have, what do I have here? One, two, three, four, five, six. Um, so let's say I have six threads available on my CPU to do this operation. So I've got six threads. So what it can say is uh, I've got one list and um, I know that you know, the order has to be retained relative to the input and the whatever. So um, all I've got to do is end up with a list that has those values squared. So it can calculate those squared values all at the same time, one on each thread. Well, I've got six, sorry. Uh, one in each thread and just uh, from beginning to end. And then as soon as each thread completes, it just places it in the appropriate position in the list. So that operation 
could be parallelized um, rather than going through and saying, well, what's four squared and then put four squared in the list and then what's seven squared and then put seven squared in the list and then calculate six squared and then put six squared in the list. And that's what we were, we were doing. Um, that's what we we're doing with the uh, for loop. Now, in, in reality, uh, we have, like, Python makes a lot of optimizations, or it can make a lot of optimizations without us ever knowing about it. So in reality, a simple loop like this honestly probably is being parallelized. Parallelized. ECC dot append one squared. So there's a good chance that this is being parallelized anyways. Um, but this is, I guess there's kind of more of a guarantee of it uh, or something. This is also less code for the, um, I put this, since Python's an interpreted language, it looks at this comprehension and it's just like, oh, I instantly know what assumptions that I can make about this. So there's kind of less overhead for the interpreter to deal with this initially. Um, it kind of knows it, since it knows it's going to solve a kind of a narrower subset of problems, it can kind of make some useful assumptions about doing that quickly. Um, so yeah. Um, let's look at comprehensions with uh, conditions. Conditions get a little bit weird. And unfortunately, we're not going to have time to get all the way into it. Always run out of time going through comprehensions. But I think that's OK. I always save it for the end of class, because if there's something I don't get all the way through, it's OK if it's comprehensions. Because like I said, it's. Um, if you know how to use for loops, you're not actually losing anything not understanding comprehensions fully. Um, they're they're neat, you know. I think this is really elegant code, but uh, and there's a potential that it's faster. Um, it's it can be. Let me put it like this: I've never I've never improved like the runtime of something like drastically by converting a for loop to a comprehension. I've definitely seen improvements, you know, like if I benchmark something with a for loop, it, it's likely to be noticeably faster with a comprehension, but, uh, and maybe it's just the, I, I haven't done all the tests or something, but I've never like made something thousands of times or hundreds or ten, even tens of times faster by converting a for loop to a comprehension. Um, I've maybe made things 20% faster, but yeah. So it, it's a it's a potentially a speed boost. Um, I think there are ser even certain situations where for loops can be faster, depending on a number of factors. But yeah, so I, I don't. I'm just saying that because I don't want people to get caught up in like, oh, I have to optimize everything uh, all the time. But I'll give an example. Uh, of doing a condition in a comprehension, and um, and we'll leave it at that. So let's just say uh, if num is less than ten, um, oh, if all the numbers are less than ten. Why don't I do something else? If the number is less than five, uh, then we'll square it. So. Print ACC. Oops. Print ACC after the for loop. And then if I want to do the same thing in the comprehension, I'm just going to put that condition here. And that'll do that there. Uh, we are out of time, but suffice it to say, if there if you have an else. Let's do something like this. Um, this this is where things get get a little funky. If you have an else, let's do. Um, why don't we just do the square root? One over. So 
something like this. If I have an else, I can't just put that here. I wish I wish they would just make it so you could do that. But uh, since we're what we're doing is we're changing the consequent, we have to do a ternary up front as part of the append. So uh, it'll be num squared if num is less than five, else um, num to the power of one over two. So yeah, if you have an else, you have to do uh, your if else up front. If you have an if or a series of ifs, you can do those at the end. You have to do those at the end. So that's kind of a weird thing with comprehensions. Um, I'll wrap up there. Sorry about going over time. Um, sorry we didn't get, get all the way through comprehensions. Just to recap though, comprehensions are a lot of fun. If you don't understand, learn them eventually. Uh, if if you're learning, if you're, you know, if you're just trying to get to the point where you can like solve problems and you know produce working algorithms and learn programming, focus on for loops and while loops. Um, if you want, if you feel really comfortable with that stuff and you want to like a new challenge, uh, comprehensions are great. Feel free to hit me up or bring it up in study hall, and I'll be happy to go over them there. Um, cool. That's it. Uh, have a good rest of your Saturday if you want to get going. I'm sure people want to wrap up and get going with the rest of their day. You'll have a good one. Uh, it's been an absolute pleasure. This group dynamic, I think, has been really great. I appreciate all the activity. Um, I'm a little sad that it's kind of getting getting to a close. Um, I look forward to seeing where all of you go. Don't be a stranger. Feel free to reach out to me if you want mentoring or if you want to say hi. Uh, come to study halls. Uh, defer into the next prep if you still need some support in that regard and um, best of luck and let me let me stop the recordings and we'll open up for questions